All right, so uh, this is the home stretch. And uh, anyway, I, I really appreciate everyone coming here. Um, and um, it's, uh, it's, it's, this is a topic that uh, I probably could do blindfold. Uh, the next subject is uh, insulin resistance. So 90% um, of my patients that are trying to lose weight and feel better, it's really, it's to reduce insulin resistance. So insulin resistance is, it's out there. Um, it doesn't matter if it's in the US. It's also, I see it in South Korea. Uh, I go there like almost every other year and I just see over time that they're just, kids are getting heavier and fatter. So um, anyway, uh, that was supposed to be like a young couple, you know, when they're first dating and then 20 years later, boom. So um, you see a lot of that. It's, it's, it's like, you know, they, they used to be very fit and then over time, they're eating three meals a day, largest meal in the evening time, just, you know, they have some stress eating, so some sugar, some soda, um, and it just adds up. So that's generally insulin resistance is what we see. So uh, obesity, two-thirds of every American um, is overweight. That's almost 200 million Americans uh, out there. Uh, so if you're not, in, not making any money in, in being a healthcare provider and helping people lose weight, you could just open a, a liquor store and a donut store and then make a lot of money there. So, so if you can't win, just, just join them. Um, I always thought, yeah, here, I'm an endocrinologist, and it's like, oh, maybe my side second business, I'll open a Dairy Queen next door. All right, so uh, childhood obesity has tripled in the last 30 years, and this is why uh, I wrote a book um, the first children's book is um, uh, Your Amazing Heart. And it's really about education. It's really teaching them what happens down the road and why sugar is bad for you. And you could tell your kids don't eat sugar or your grandkids don't eat sugar. If they don't understand why, then they're not gonna do it. So it's all about education. And here is a, I've looked at all these children's books and they're boring and I mean, I even fell asleep with some of them. Uh, in the endocrine world, the, the, the children's book. But so I, I decided to write, um, to kind of make a difference in the, in the next generation uh, to educate them. And I've volunteered and have read uh, these books in um, you know, second grade, third grade, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh. And the younger they are, it's actually, you know, they're, 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 they get it faster. And that's where we have to start. It's like, you know, we're, we're battling all these diseases, but we should be starting at a younger age. That's the thing, it's education, education, education. And I bet you, like, like you guys, you didn't learn about how many servings of vegetables you should have in elementary school. I mean, you, they, asked, they asked like the top, I think it was from Pennsylvania, football team. You know, football is like, you know, really big. They asked all the, the high school kids, that are on the football team. How many serve the vegetables? They don't know. That's the thing. It's just, it's, anyway, the answer is three or more. So, um, if you didn't know. So, there's a worldwide obesity, uh, too, and uh, insulin resistance has a lot to do with it. So, you can look at belly fat um, as a quick, um, you know, test to see if they have insulin resistance. So, here's a question. Which hormone is associated with prediabetes, Alzheimer's, hypertension, heart disease, stroke, impotence, infertility, obesity, autoimmune disease, and cancer. It, perfect, insulin, insulin, insulin. It's actually high insulin levels or insulin resistance. So the classic um, sign is, what, what do you call this on the back of the skin? It's not a dirty, the person took a shower and all that, so what do you call that? It's called acanthosis nigricans. Um, when my kids and I, my family, we took a uh, spring break to S San Francisco. We got on the elevator and uh, we got on, and then another family came on, two big boys, huge, eating ice cream, and th on the other hand, they have also uh, big you know, soda. And they, were, they came, turned around, and both on the back had this. And that's basically a sign of basically insulin resistance and they're probably like 10 years old. So it doesn't, you can't wash this off. They have to change their diet, that's the thing. And the insulin resistance increases the risk of what cancer? Colon cancer. So 
they're already at 10 years old about that it's like my kids were even just staring at them like wow um, these kids are big so um, anyway elevated insulin levels is is one of those things that um, you'll never lose weight um, and I check a lot of fasting insulin levels. So I have patients come and they go, Dr. Lee, I don't eat any sugar. Oh yeah, okay. your insulin level, I'm trying to get a level about three or less. And their insulin level's like 18. It's like, well, you're not telling me something, but whatever you're doing, we gotta lower your insulin levels. Um, so we'll go through their snacks and they go, okay, let's pick one, rice cakes. And they go, yeah, 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 I have some rice cakes. Okay, let's get that out of your diet. Um, so the thing is that, um, all weightlifters, if you're into the gym and you know, they're gonna compete and they're ripped and they have like 5% body fat, they never even put an Oreo cookie in their mouth because they know that spikes insulin and insulin will cause that belly fat. So that's an extreme. And you know, the weightlifters get it because if you eat too, too much sugar, it's gonna basically spike up that hormone insulin and insulin's gonna cause that belly fat. So, Insulin resistance is the condition where the fat, muscle, and liver becomes resistant to insulin. So your pancreas has to produce more insulin to overcome it. So an analogy is like um, insulin has to basically open this door. And if you have insulin sensitivity, it just, you can open this door nicely. It goes in, opens up, glucose goes into the muscle cell, and it works. If you have insulin resistance, that door is jammed, and you need like 10, of, 10 you know, people to open up that door. More insulin secreted, open that door so glucose goes in your muscle. So that's insulin resistance. When you, your body has to produce more insulin for it to basically, quote, be normal. So factors influence insulin resistance. Um, well, you're, you can't change this, but it's part of your nationality. Uh, Asians, um, just in case you didn't know what I was. Um, <laughs> Hispanic. Uh, some people think I'm Hispanic. Uh, African American, American Indian. Although I did the 23andMe, I'm less than 0.1% Navajo Indian or something like that. So, um, anyway, um, but environmental influence. This is huge. High fructose corn syrup. It's in everything. You go down every aisle in the supermarket, excluding the outer, which is probably the healthiest one, where you have fruits and vegetables, and the meats, is loaded with high fructose corn syrup. It's everything. It, our, our government basically, it's, it's, it's basically, it's one of those things that we, we subsidize our farmers and for corn and we make high fructose corn syrup so we can basically you know, put all that stuff in. Um, trans fat steroid use, uh, inflammation can all basically be uh, factors to cause some sort of resistance. So here's an, a kind of an important slide where you have uh, pre-diabetes and then diabetes. So um, the onset of diabetes, let's say, is right here at zero. But you can see that the insulin levels are climbing before um, you get the onset of diabetes. And then you have beta cell, beta cell failure, and, the, and your insulin cannot keep up, and your blood sugar goes up. So you can have a normal glucose of, let's say, 90. An A1C, that's like 5.2. But if you're not checking a fasting insulin level, you're missing the boat. You need to check a fasting insulin level. That's going to tell you everything about insulin resistance. And I've seen people with A1C 5.2 with insulin levels over 10, and you know, you 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 get their insulin level down, boom, they start losing weight. So there's a condition with insulin resistance. It's it's just nomenclature. This is metabolic syndrome. It's part of insulin resistance, but you've heard about this, the metabolic syndrome. You just need three or more. So for men, you need a waist circumference over 40 inches, triglycerides over 150, HDL under 40, blood pressure 130 over 85, uh, if it's higher, or glucose over 100. For women, waist over 35 inches, and then triglycerides over 150, HDL less than 50, blood pressure over 130 over 85, and, and glucose over 100, so three out of the five you can basically diagnose that code as uh, metabolic syndrome. I, I know all the ICD-9 codes. I, I'm struggling with the ICD-10 codes, so I have no idea what the ICD-10 code is, but it used to be 277.7. Um, anyway, um, 
Insulin resistance is a condition um, that basically is not just only going to get you fat, but it actually forms placking and the tau protein in the brain that leads to Alzheimer's. So that's really, if you want to lower your risk, I had a professional golfer who um, actually did very well in the PGA. A lot of golfers live in Orlando. I have a lot of uh, golfers, LPGA, PGA. Um, and one of them says, my father has um, Alzheimer, my mother has Alzheimer's, am I going to get it? That was the consultation. And it turns out that he had the positive for APOE4 double hit. So it's like, oof, not good. You have the genes. But it's like, a, like if you think of this, if your genes is like a loaded gun, it's your lifestyle that pulls the trigger. So just because you have the genetic makeup for it does not mean that you're going to get Alzheimer's. You have to detox. You have to optimize your hormones. You have to fix leaky gut. You have to reduce stress. You have to basically um, get better nutrients and uh, reduce insulin resistance. So lifestyle modification. He's, he drinks a lot, smokes a lot. I still see him like at some restaurants. And he goes, hey, Dr. Lee. And it's like, uh, he hasn't come back. But th the thing is that he's, he doesn't want to change. That's the thing. So, so it's like Russian roulette. Will he get it? I don't know. Um, erectile dysfunction or male impotence is huge. It's one of those things that insulin resistance uh, lowers nitric oxide. Nitric oxide is really it's it's a it's an important secondary uh, chemical messenger. Nitric oxide is basically a gas to open up your blood vessel. It's not laughing gas. Laughing gas is nitrous oxide. This is an, it, nitrous oxide. That's nitrous oxide. This is uh, nitric oxide. So there are two different gases. So nitric oxide is really important in terms of um, uh, to improve. So the thing is that um, heart disease is huge. It's one of the biggest things also for strokes. So there's, there's a lot of data. I just kind of limited to one, one study per, per line. Um, PCOS is one of those things that um, that's really one of the foundation of polycystic ovary syndrome is insulin resistance. Um, it actually, high insulin level stimulates the ovaries to make testosterone and, and basically you're going to have that whole dysfunction. Um, autoimmune disease is huge, huge and also cancer. So I'm not a big cholesterol. Uh, Lipid person, I do. I could do advanced lipid testing, but I think that's like so 1980s. It's like, uh, and I have patients. You know, if I don't order lipids, they always say, "Did you do lipids?" It's like, no, but we could do. We can measure how much plaque you have. So we have on. Um, we have an ultrasound machine that we can measure exactly how much uh, plaque you have in your carotid arteries, and. Um, that's more important because as we age, plaque can build up, and if it ruptures, you're going to form an immediate blood clot, and it could be the widow maker. So um, the classic study was during the 1950s. It was the Korean War. There was a rise in heart disease, and they understood the blood clot. They, they got that, but they couldn't understand what caused the blood clot. So they did, I don't know if you've you heard of this study, but it was during the Korean War. So they basically autopsy all the healthiest, I mean, all these 20 25 year old uh, Americans that died during the Korean War. They opened up their, their chest, looked at the coronary artery, and they were shocked that all of them had plaque. And here's the healthier, healthiest Americans, you know, in the early 20s, that already had plaque. And that was the aha moment. That was like, oh. So they did another study on five year olds that didn't die during the war. And guess what they found? Early progression of plaque. So it's the birthday cakes. It's the sodas. It's the Chick-fil-A's. It's probably the fried foods. It's trans fat. It's everything that basically, you know, what we're feeding our kids. So I actually, I'm proud to say that for um, my, my family, we were, we were in San Diego. And uh, I had to do, I had to go to uh, like a meeting. So my wife was meeting her friend, and uh, she took the kids early. We had two boys, and uh, she wanted to grab something fast. And she drove into McDonald's, and my kids were like probably five and four. And they go, Mama, if we eat at McDonald's, we're going to die. That's what Daddy says, we're going to die. <laughs> <laughs> so I trained them at a young age. <laughs>
To this day, they haven't touched McDonald's. So. <laughs> now I say, if you touch, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> so there's two different types of fat. There's uh, baby fat, uh, and then there's um, visceral fat. So uh, visceral fat's your inside fat. Uh, this is the one that's uh, metabolically uh, damaging. This is the one that can kill you. Um, and you cannot remove visceral fat with liposuction. Um, it, you're just removing subcutaneous fat. You're not removing the visceral fat. And visceral fat is an endocrine organ. Uh, when I did, you know, at, at University of Pitt, I mean, we didn't talk about, you know, adiponectin, leptin, because it wasn't out then by then, but fat cells make all these hormones. And uh, this is really interesting. So you, you have the outside fat, the, the sub-Q, but inside fat is the, basically the visceral fat. So here's a guy. Um, you know, the thing is that um, he has uh, the, the beer belly, but, uh, you know, insulin, you know, all, you know, there's different names, the beer belly, spare tire, muffin top. It's really all associated with uh, insulin resistance. So here's a guy with the beer belly. He looks happy. Um, sometimes ignorance is a bliss. So anyway, the thing is that uh, visceral fat secretes many different hormones, liptin, adiponectin, resistin. Um, and they all do different things, but the thing is that um, um, adiponectin decreases uh, with becoming um, diabetic, and adiponectin helps with uh, glucose and fat metabolism. Um, and uh, there's, I have a slide here that shows that, uh, so it's not here, probably the next one. But the thing is that um, with metabolic syndrome, or with insulin resistance, you're going to have poor quality of life, you're going to have high levels of insulin, you're going to have increased visceral fat. You're going to have high inflammation, which is the cytokines. Your endothelial dysfunction. Um, you're going to have high levels of free fatty acids, um, and uh, it's just going to. You're just developing the perfect storm to form plaque. Uh, so, believe it or not, I have a history of metabolic syndrome. Um, so. I actually had, this, this is my blood work, not proud of it, but uh, I had a triglycerides over 730 fasting, uh, glucose 105, low HDL, blood pressure borderline, waist size 36. So I met f basically three out of, you know, the criteria for metabolic syndrome. Uh, that's because I got married. Uh, you know, after getting married, you, you're, I just, just love to eat, and boom. So I have the fat gene, you know, if I eat too much and don't exercise, boom. So um, I realized my wife was killing me slowly. So actually, I got into doing triathlons, and uh, so I was addicted to this. So I was just like, like I said, you know, practicing endocrine was just a second job, and training and racing was my first passion. Um, this thing is, I'm not a good runner. That's why I, um, I'm a good swimmer and cyclist. I'm just never a good runner. But uh, this is me. Um, and I have a friend named Nick, and uh, he was just like in early college, so I would beat him all the time. But I knew that didn't last long. Eventually, he got faster and beat, would beat me. But uh, I mean, if I get the weight down and exercise and work out hard, I can reverse insulin resistance. You can reverse diabetes. You can reverse all that. So that's the point: is that you can exercise and be healthy. Anyway, now I'm a busy dad, and all I do is take my kids back and forth to all these events. <laughs> But uh, yeah, you have to exercise. So there was a study called the uh, Diabetes Prevention Program. And uh, this was a cool study. Over 3,000 patients with prediabetes. They looked at lifestyle modification, metformin, or placebo. And this was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. And it's amazing. You know, a simple study like this, and you, know, it get, you get these results. It's like, I think it's common sense, but anyway. Um, Lifestyle modification reduced the risk of diabetes by 71%, uh, better than metformin or placebo. It's like, duh. <laughs> it's just like, come on. But there's data that shows, hey, this is over 3,000 patients. You got to do lifestyle modification. So that's important. So what can you do in your office? Uh, what tests can you do in your office on Monday to check for insulin resistance? Glucometer, perfect. It, uh, glucometer basically is going to check th their glucose, and everyone probably ate in there. I mean, I wanted to do 
everyone's finger stick because we all had lunch, but anyway, it didn't work out. But you should check your blood sugar. And you know what, what should your blood sugar be one hour after eating? Anyone? Someone? Throw out a number. No, 200, you're a diabetic. 120, that's two hours later. 140 or less. So you're going to pick up a lot of insulin resistance, a lot of metabolic prediabetes, when, when their one hour finger stick is uh, basically 140 to, to under 200. Over 200, they're, you know, they're diabetic. So you have to confirm by blood work anyway. So, but the thing is that that's the open to discussion. Say, oh, you want to lose weight? Hmm, your, your post-meal blood sugar is elevated. Let's, let's work on it. So you can go to Walmart and get a glucometer machine, the, the, the brand. You don't need a prescription, just go there. The, that's the cheapest glucometer. I, I mean, I used to use all these fancy brands and then when I got into my own private practice, um, actually I don't see a lot of diabetics anymore. So I used to have, from all the companies, they would like Bayer and all these companies, I mean just this wall to wall stack of glucometers. I couldn't give it out fast enough. Now they don't even visit me because I don't have any numbers. Like I don't, you know, I don't write a lot of insulin, so that's why they don't see me. So I, you know, you just go to Wal you know, Walmart and get their brand, and you can check their blood sugars. And it, it's, I mean, it's the test strips that cost a lot of money. So you can check their blood sugar and see what happens. So check a fasting insulin level is the best. The second is just a postprandial blood sugar. So optimal level I mentioned should be less than three. Um, and what happens if the insulin level is zero, assuming they're alive? What happens? Type, type, one. type one diabetic, right? All right, Rashid. Good. So type one they're a type one diabetic. All right. Next slide is a lot of data that shows to help metabolic syndrome or insulin resistance. Um, and let's go over the um, couple of them. Fish oil reduces, uh, or omega-3 reduces inflammation. It actually improves insulin sensitivity uh, by affecting the PPAR receptor. Um, and then 12 weeks of 3.6 grams of omega-3 improved fasting insulin, glucose, and lipids. Uh, that's a little older study in 1999. Curcumin dates back to 2000 BC. Um, so a lot, of, I have, I have so, not a lot, but I have several different ethnic groups that see me, and, and I see a lot of overweight Indians. Um, and um, actually, I go over to my next door neighbor house if I ever want Indian food, because uh, they're Indian. And it turns out he's a pediatric endocrinologist. So what's, what's the chance that two endocrinologists live right next to each other? I mean, that's zero. I mean, I mean endocrinologists overall are very few. Um, Pediatric endo is even fewer, and to have them living right next door. But the thing is that um, I see a lot of their friends. You know, they always have like a party, and they never have a time. It's always like, what time does it start? Oh, it's will start sometime. So it's like I just wait till all the cars are filled up, and then I go over. <laughs> but I, I, I've been to their house many times, and you know, it's the naan and the and the basmati rice, and it's all the carbs that you know. It's really carb loaded. So yes, it's used in curry. But um, you, it has a lot of benefits. But what you do with the curry is what you have to worry about. So I was, for years, on an Indian food kick. I just, on my credit card, it was Saffron, which is an Indian restaurant. Saffron, 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 Saffron. I mean, we went to uh, skiing in, in uh, Vermont. And the first question I asked at the, at the hotel is, do you guys have an Indian restaurant? And my wife kicked me. It's like, you just had it before you left Orlando. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, no, they didn't have it there. Uh, the thing is that um, I actually kind of, since I came there so often, they would never give me rice or naan. They would just give me steamed vegetables. And I would just dip the, the, the vegetables in the curry. That's how I ate it. So it's a thing. So curcumin, you know, curry, but it has a lot of data. Um, and um, anyway, one, you know, here's a study that um, showed that it lowered the use of insulin in, in diabetics. Um, it also has some anti-carcinogenic effects. Um, it can reduce inflammation by decreasing tumor necrosis factor and nucleofactor kappa beta. Um, and uh, the dosage is about 1,000 to 2,000 milligrams 
a date that appears to be effective. So flavonoids is a whole group. Um, you know, flavonoids is really that the, the colorful fruits and vegetables, the pig pigmentations there. So flavonoids, uh, 10,000 uh, plus patient study in Finland over a year showed that a higher intake of flavonoids lower the risk of developing diabetes. Do you guys know that in Scandinavia, this is like I was telling my wife, I want to move to Norway. I want to move to Sweden. And she says, why? It's because the government gets it. Our government doesn't get it. They basically will pay you to, to work out every hour, one hour per day. You play basketball, you work out, they'll pay your membership. They, they have people in the 50s, 60s who are 100 times healthier than we have. So they, it's one of those things that they actually pay you to be, to be active. That's the thing. That's the whole system. And you know, it gets dark in the wintertime there, but there's cross-country skiing. They, they make all these little different activities that you can do. But she doesn't want to go there because it's too cold. So. Anyway, alpha lipoic acid, uh, basically, um, that's a, this is an important uh, supplement uh, to basically help um, increase the GLUT4 production. GLUT4 are really these receptors, so when insulin activates the GLUT4 receptors, that's how glucose and insulin gets into the cell. Um, ALA has been shown to decrease inflammation and uh, with decreasing IL-6 and PI-1. Um, CoQ10, huge. I use a lot of CoQ10. CoQ10, um, 200 milligrams of CoQ10 uh, has helped lower blood glucose and A1C in type 2 diabetics. Um, another study showed that it improved on insulin resistance, lowers inflammation. So um, anyway, the dose is 100 to 300 milligrams a day. Magnesium, that's probably the number one um, nutrient that I see that are deficient when we do this. Uh, uh, Evaluation of uh, see what nutrients are deficient. So magnesium is crucial, and uh, anyway, it's it when you do a serum magnesium, it's really just not that important because one percent is um, less than one percent magnesium is in our uh, blood. Most is actually intracellular. I just noticed that it's a typo there. Um, anyway, important to measure magnesium by RBC magnesium to to get a better uh, reflection where you're at. So um, one study shows a dose of 365 milligrams of magnesium to improve, improve on insulin resistance. Uh, the, the Women's Health Study uh, shows that uh, dietary magnesium intake had a, um, there's a relationship with developing diabetes if you didn't, you didn't have a um, high intake of it. And then another study, a randomized study, gold, this is the gold standard study in diabetes, so 1,000 milligrams of magnesium oxide improved on glucose control. So um, a lot of data on magnesium. Uh, second, I think data that has also um, some interesting data is uh, chromium. So um, I know there's a lot of supplements out there to help lower blood sugars and all that. So chromium, you've, you've all used. And you can look at this you know, study here. But I like vitamin D. A vitamin D is it's not a vitamin. It's really a hormone. And so vitamin D really is important. I try to get all my levels, all my patients over 65. I, I personally take 10,000 units of vitamin D3 a day. Um, and uh, some patients up to 20,000 units of vitamin D. Um, you know, I live in Orlando, so you, it's Sunshine Belt, the Sunshine State. And I have so many professional golfers. They, all they do is play golf and they're outside. And they're like in their 30s, 40s. Their vitamin D is like 30. So it's okay, but you know, the data that actually I'm really interested in shows that people with cancer, without cancer, people without cancer, all the vitamin D levels were over 65. People with levels of 30, that's where you get the cancer. So now there's no study that shows you take vitamin D, a prospective control study that shows you take vitamin D, it's going to reduce cancer. We, we need like 20 years before that data comes out. But uh, I'm not waiting. That's why I encourage my patients to take vitamin D3. But it's also been shown to reduce uh, heart disease. Um, in addition, there was a California study, uh, 126 healthy Californians, showed a level of vitamin D associated with uh, insulin sensitivity. So uh, if they had a vitamin D very low, less than 20, they had a higher risk of insulin resistance and, and metabolic syndrome. So does anybody know what this is? Yes, you had a question? So you try to get your dial patients up to 65? Yep. Nanograms per deciliter, yes. 
All right, so does anybody know what this lizard is? All right, Gila monster. So the Gila monster, I think, is a pretty lizard. I, the only time I've seen it was in Washington, D.C., in their zoo. Um, I was really excited when I saw it. It's like, wow, I finally saw it. So it's a poisonous lizard. There's only like two poisonous lizards in the United States. But what's interesting about this is, you probably don't know, is that this lizard only eats two times a year. It's a cold-blooded reptile. Most cold-blooded reptiles eat once a year. So no one understood why. You can't ask it because if it bites you, you're dead. So, uh, so the thing is that they found a hormone in the spit of the lizard called GLP-1. And that discovery of GLP-1 opened a whole door of diabetes. That's where it, it was a new test. And that's why I tell some people, if you can live seven to 10 years more, something brand new is going to come and it's going to change. Uh, that's, that's really, you know, medicine does change. So GLP-1 hormone is really, in, they believe that the GLP-1 hormone called glucagon-like peptide 1 is believed to turn down the lizard's appetite. As we make GLP-1, but as we age, our GLP-1 levels drop and weight goes up. So G GLP-1 is a very important um, hormone. Um, oh. So there's so many different types of diets. I hate to say diet because that's to me, you know, doesn't sound right. But anyway, you know what diet means. I think of lifestyle modification. There's a plant-based diet to lower insulin resistance, paleo, gra grain-free. We talked about modified fast, vegan diet, but you gotta be careful all the rice and bread. Uh, pescatarian diet, uh, raw food diet. So what's the best um, diet out there? I think whatever works for the patient. So not everyone could do number one or number two. Somebody likes number three. So you have to you know, give and take and see what works. Some people are motivated, I mean, motivated to do the modified fast. They just say, I'm not hungry, I'm just, it's just a cultural thing, I just eat. And you go, you know, and they lose weight by just skipping dinner after five o'clock. They do really well. Um, you know, I have other people who do really well with a plant-based diet, and they start losing weight, uh, improve on insulin sensitivity. Um, the thing that I like recently is the raw food diet, and I didn't eat raw this, you know, for breakfast or lunch today or last night, but the thing is that um, for about three months I've been on a raw food diet, I've been on and off uh, raw food diet, and uh, I have diabetics get off their type 2, type two diabetics off their insulin, uh, lower their blood pressure medicine, or even get off their blood pressure medicine. Uh, it's not for everyone. Um, there's things that uh, you know, I ask, I ask some simple questions. Do you like vegetables? And they say, yes, that's good. Do you like fruits? Oh, I love fruits. Do you like nuts? I love nuts. Do you like, like nut butters, like almond butter, walnut butter? Oh, I love that. Do you like avocados? Uh-huh, I like that. And do you like sashimi? That's like, you know, if they're a certain age, 15 and above, they're like, eh, no. Under 50, they tend to like it. Um, but if you like sashimi, that's phenomenal. If you like raw oysters, beef carpaccio, fermented foods, oh, you can have a blast with a raw food diet. I love raw food diet because there's no limitation. You can eat as much as you want, as often as you want, and you'll lose weight. There's a place called the Hippoc Hippocrates Center in South Florida. It was developed by a woman that defeated cancer by going raw. So she has people coming three weeks at a time. Some people can't handle it, some people handle it. There are people that just want to do wellness. So they teach them how to eat raw. And the joke is, by the time dinner comes, you don't want to eat. You know why? Your mouth is so sore from chewing. <laughs> so it's a lot of chewing. And that's the whole purpose. When you go raw, you're going to increase your GLP-1. Because think about it. Most people for breakfast, they'll have a bagel. They'll have a muffin. I mean, it's cereal with cow's milk. I mean, it's just one of those things. They just plow it down drink a sh shake maybe, there's no chewing involved. Whereas raw, you can't go fast. I mean, in the morning time, I, sometimes I have carrot sticks, I use cauliflower, sometimes I dip some of the cauliflower into the, in the fermented pickles and just shake it up and the next morning I eat that. My kids think I'm weird. 
a can of beets, I have some pickles, I have, I really have apples and some bananas and nut butters and, and it's just really healthy for you and you're gonna feel better. You know, my acupuncturist told me to go raw and she told me two years ago to try raw. And the funny story was when I came home, I told my wife I'm gonna go raw and she grew up in South Korea. She learned English outside the US and she goes, I ain't doing it. Like, I taught her to work eight. <laughs> I said, it's not for you, I'm doing it. And then eight days into it, because she asked me, because I told her in the beginning, I think I'm gonna lose a little weight with it. I got off my blood pressure medicine that I started because I had a lot of stress in three days. Day four, I checked my blood work, I'm just curious. My blood sugar is the lowest in 12 years. Uh, here I'm a diabetes board certified endocrinologist, diabetes specialist, and I see the, wall, the writing on the wall, you're gonna get diabetes. And it's like, oh, it's just like, it's just slowly going up, and my blood sugar, I was so happy, low 80s. Day five, I had this hip pain, totally gone. I was gonna get injected at the orthopedic center. Day eight, lost eight pounds. And then my wife goes, I'm doing it. And I was like, hold it, didn't you tell me a week ago you ain't doing it, now you're doing it, you're confusing me. So she lost weight too. So anyway, um, the raw food diet does work. It's like if they don't like vegetables, they don't like you know, a lot of the things, it, it may not work for them. But if they're open-minded, I mean, I would actually you know, tr you know, try yourself. So back to that lizard, the GLP-1 hormone. Um, it's basically, it's a diabetic medicine. It's not gonna, um, if your blood sugars are normal, let's say 90, and you take uh, Bieta or Xenotide, it's not gonna lower your blood sugars. Only if it's high, your blood sugars come down. That's, this is the beauty of the GLP-1 hormone. So GLP-1 is made in your small intestines, and it can lower your glucagon levels, which in all diabetics, believe it or not, they have high glucagon levels. And there's no drug, not even insulin, that lowers glucagon. So it lowers glucagon so that you don't have all that gluconeogenesis in your liver. In addition, it also causes early satiety. So that's how you lose weight. I tried this medication 10 years ago, because every 10 years I have to take a recertification exam. So I'm due again, which oh, I hate, um, internal medicine. So I've, anyway, I think, all right, I'll do it because it's a mental challenge to keep the brain working. <laughs> it's a punishment. But anyway, the thing is that um, when I, it comes in an injection, it's a prescription medicine. And when I injected, uh, I, when I was eating dinner, I remember what I was eating halfway, I could not even finish. It's like that Thanksgiving meal, you kind of overstuff and then you want dessert, but you can't eat it for three hours because you can't even breathe. That's what GL, this GLP medicine does. So I have a lot of people who are on GLP-1, short-term use to help them lose weight, to get their GLP-1 levels up. Um, so GLP-1 basically can help weight loss, lower insulin resistance, lower glucagon levels. Side effects is nausea, sometimes vomiting. No one's dying with this. There's some TV you know, commercials, radio shows, if you're on this medicine call, no one's dying. Um, I mean, there was some association with pancreatitis. So I tell my patients, if you're doing fine with this medication and then six months down the road you're, you're vomiting, stop it because you may be developing pancreatitis. I've only seen one case of that out of like, I've like, was one of the top writers for, with uh, this medication. Um, in addition, um, I really believe that lifestyle modification, so this is a medicine th that can help. Um, and then the, the better one, the second generation is called uh, uh, Victoza or Liraglutide. And the reason why I like it is that by it, it comes in one dose, five micrograms. Either you can tolerate it or you don't. My wife could not tolerate it, she got nauseous. But with um, Victoza, there's 30 doses. So you can click and then titrate and see what you do. And it lasts one day, 24 hours, versus um, Bieta, which lasts only 12 hours. And you can play with it, and I have a lot of people who um, love it. So the treatment, I kind of talked about two medications that you can prescribe, um, but it's really lifestyle modification. There, uh, you have to lower insulin levels, and you have to check your insulin levels. And th that's one thing I strongly recommend. You have to have more servings of vegetables. If you eat vegetables, I recommend raw. 
I don't say everyone should go a raw food diet, but I mean, it, I think that's one of the healthiest. Um, increase physical activity and also optimize nutritional support. So uh, I do have a book. Um, it's, I, I don't have it in my office anymore because I sold it all out, but uh, there's, uh, it's a whole book about insulin resistance, uh, the dangers of it and why high insulin levels are bad for you. So, um, and it's the first book of its kind that has two different nutritionists writing two different dietary plans. So one from the West Coast, one from the East Coast, one kind of basic and one very uh, modern. So um, technically it's like three books in one. So I kind of mentioned that I was on a journey um, to really educate the youth. And anyway, this book, Your Amazing Heart, is also on, um, there, there's an animated version on Apple iTunes. And um, so if your kids have I, you know, Apple iPad or on their new smartphone, you can download the book. And everything's animated. It has music. It's interactive. Um, and it, it really, it teaches kids and also adults uh, you know, what happens if you don't take care of yourself. So I have some patients of mine who truly have some issues. Met, um, and I'm worried about their metabolic syndrome, their insulin resistance. And I say, here's my kid's book. Don't read it. Just let's look at pictures. So there's a time capsule. What happens you know, if you eat too much sugar in 10 years, 20 years, 30 years? And then you see the plaque rupture, and boom, you have a blood clot. And then, bam, you have a heart attack. I just show them the pictures, because pictures is like a 1,000 words. And then the, 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 I mean, the response I'll get is, how do I measure my plaque? And it's like, well, we, we have a test on Thursday, and let's see how much plaque you have, and let's see if we can reduce it, because we all have plaque. And let's change your diet, because high insulin levels. High insulin levels, this is another pearl I tell my patient. It's like broken glass that goes down your blood vessels. Shattered glass, imagining, going down your blood vessels, opening up the lining causing endothelial dysfunction, cholesterol gets in, it gets oxidized, boom, that's part of the plaque production. Heavy metals comes in, there's all this junk that comes in that forms that plaque. So you really got to lower that insulin level, so that's the key. So we talked about adrenal fatigue. I know it's been a long day. Uh, no, it's not? <laughs> long day for me. Um, I'm getting adrenal fatigue. <laughs> Um, detoxification, thyroid, and insulin resistance, this is all important concepts, but the thing is that uh, it's all important to really, you know, just work on sleep, poop, I, you know, that's the top two things I work with. You know, I also work on detoxification because I think that's key. Try to get their hormones balanced and work on better nutrients, and it's all about education. So uh, if you like this book, post it on Amazon.com. Um, and, you know, mention about it. Uh, sometimes I tell doctors, you know, if you like to have it in your office, just write office copy with a Sharpie pen because if you have it in your waiting room, it'll walk in a day. It'll be gone. So anyway, um, I have another book called Your Awesome Brain, um, and it's the first book that talks about dangers of playing football. I know Pittsburgh is a big, you know, city in football, but, uh, I mean, it's, it's, there's a movie now, Concussion. So the third, and uh, I have a future book in my head, I just don't have the time, um, but it'll be about the liver. And, and uh, so it's all about education, educating the next generation. So that's, that's really key. So I, I, I thank you. If you have any questions, please feel free. Um, Jamie, do you have something you want to talk about? All right. All right, just a couple of last things and we'll get out of here right on time. So. Some of the protocols and formulas Dr. Lee talked about, of course, the omega-3D, the triple strength fish oil and vitamin D. It's imperative to the cells so that better intracellular communication. He was talking about insulin resistance and you know, not being able to push those cell doors open. And I think that's one of the keys to realize for us and the patients that these are food-based nutrients first, you know, the super shake, but then the fish oil, because the oils, as we know, are embedded in every cell, right, in the membrane. So when somebody's insulin resistant, that cell looks more harder, dehydrated, and more rigid. So it's more like a raisin. So with the implementation of fish oils, you can restore and reverse the insulin resistance and make those cells more like a grape, very hydrated and full, 
So communication inside and outside is much better. So one thing is the omega-3D. He talked about quite a few nutrients, including alpha lipoic acid, chromium. I know he mentioned cinnamon, a couple others. We have them in one formulation called Sugar Solve. We have numerous case studies, probably hundreds now at this point, of people that we've been able to reverse diabetes and insulin resistance in type 2 patients. So that's Sugar Solve. We have another formula that's similar, but it's got three really com uh, nice components. So if the patient is having neuropathies for any reason, especially diabetic neuropathies, we found with glycation the sugar becomes corroding or rusting of the ends of the nerves. So people get tingling or numbness in the fingers and toes. So we have a formula specific for that called neuropathies. So that's a combination of some of the ingredients he talked about, the chromium, <clears throat> some of the minerals that he talked about, alpha lipoic acid. It also has B vitamins in it, the activated Bs, and Boswellia as an anti-inflammatory because that process is pro-inflammatory. So omega-3D, sugar solve, neuropathies are our top three. Just two more that he talked about. One is Mad Complete. You know, there was a great article in the Post-Gazette, even UPMC admitted that over 95%, so basically everybody is magnesium de deficient, especially people at, um, that have cardiovascular issues, obesity, diabetes, all magnesium deficient. And the last one, he had mentioned turmeric or curcumin. We have an isolated formula, it's called turmeric plus. When you take curcumin or turmeric orally, you should always combine it with either cayenne pepper or black pepper. That absorbs, uh, increases the absorbency in between 30 and 50%, depending on animal versus human studies. So omega-3D, sugar solve, mag complete, and then two supports would be neuropathies and turmeric plus. So we passed out some surveys. I know everyone wants to go. If you take a minute or two, it's very helpful for us because we do listen to um, the compliments and also the suggestions, so thank you. We have specials running throughout next week, 10% off of everything. If you want to buy a little more volume, you can do a five plus one. We don't usually do that. So you can do a five plus one or 10%. You can do it as many times as you want from now till whenever the ladies say it's over, probably the end of the month. And lastly, I'd like to give a nice uh, departure and um, round of applause for Dr. Lee. And as I knew, he may not be able to do a four-hour speech, but he could do two two-hour speeches. So <laughs> thanks, everyone, for coming. I really appreciate it. We got some free bottles of vitamin D for you. You can grab those on the way out, any literature and samples you want. Thanks so much. We appreciate all support. Thanks, folks.